Welcome to the Washington Heights Church Podcast. We're so glad you're here. Each week, we bring you the latest Sunday message filled with God's Word to help strengthen your faith and deepen your walk with Christ. Whether you're tuning in from home, your commute, or anywhere in between, we're thrilled to have you join our community. So grab a cup of coffee, find a cozy spot, and let's get started. So today we're starting a new series, as you see in the book of Galatians, and we're going to get there in a couple minutes, but we had some important announcements to share with you before that. One of the things we like to do at Washington Heights is to serve, serve beyond ourselves, serve our community, just show the love of God in practical ways. And we have one of those unique and specific ways coming up. What is that? That's for right. We're going to partner with the Lantern House. The Lantern House is a local homeless shelter where they take in families families and everyone, and they have some real specific needs, and they're pretty basic stuff, Roy. I mean, you guys look on here, canned vegetables, pastas, like Pop-Tarts. It's just real simple stuff. It's all in a package. It's just real easy. They also have some shelter, gas cards, grocery cards, and this is the key one, too, like teen clothing new. So teens there, they, they still have to go to high school, but their clothes look like they come from a homeless shelter, they said. They said all the babies get stuff and all the adult stuff get stuff. The teens don't get anything. So if we could get them new clothes, it would blow their mind and help them at that age time period. So Where do you buy your jeans? Uh, we're we're going to get my jeans, those, uh... get them some boots. <laughs> <laughs> How about my pink shoes? <laughs> yeah, so we're going to kick this off. So if you guys start collecting it, we're actually going to have it available where we're going to open it up and start collecting it on May 22nd. That's the night of worship. So the trailer will be open. We'll all be there. So start collecting it and bring it then. And that list will be on our website as yep. well. So if you don't get it down today, you can always go to the church's website, whc.faith, and you can see that list there as awesome. well. And you talked about the night of worship. Let me transition a okay. little bit to that, and Thanks. I'll send you back to your Bye. room, Jimmy. Uh, <laughs> thank you for making stuff like that happen. Hey, we've got a couple special events coming up. And, you know, during the pandemic, one of the things we did is we had an outside service because at that time we had no other option. But we loved doing that. And so we're going to keep that going forward. And so on May 22nd, that's a Saturday night, we're going to have an outside uh, event. And there's going to be dinner, there's going to be food trucks, and there's going to be different activities, bounce houses, and we're going to throw some axes. Who doesn't love to get together? and throw some axes, not at each other. Hopefully, we're going to have some targets. Amen. And then at 7, um, from 7 to 8.30, our amazing team of musicians and vocalists are going to lead us in a time of worship as we basically, you know, just honor God through that time. Then the next day on Sunday morning, May 23rd, there's going to be one service at 10 a.m. It's going to be outside. Pray with us that we get a nice Utah spring day um, there for that. And uh, that is always a blast. And we just want you to be aware of what's coming. And we'll let you know that in the next couple of weeks because it's only a couple of weeks from now. So let's turn our attention to the message for today, new series, and I want to begin with a picture that I believe pictures what this whole series is going to be about for the next several weeks. And to do that, I want to go back in time, and let me just take a quick poll here. How many of you that are here right now were not alive in 1988? Can I see your hands Wow. Okay. We're going to jump back to 1988, and some people here in this room may remember this story, but at Point Barrow, Alaska, winter set in early, and it set in hard. And when it did, it froze over a section of the ocean for the span of several miles. Well, there were some folks from a fishing village up there, and they went and hacked through the ice and made a hole in the ice. And then, much to their surprise, all of a sudden, this whale underneath comes up, like, you know, throws this, you know, spray out through its blowhole and is breathing through this little hole. And what they came to realize, because when that one went down, another one came up and was breathing. Then another one came up and was breathing. Three California gray whales were trapped under that ice. And so they were coming up to that hole just in, in order to breathe and to stay 
alive. And so these people realize, you know, well, they're in danger. They try to make that hole bigger. Before you know it, one of them runs back to the town and gets some other people out there, and it becomes this community effort. Some guys bring chainsaws, and they're making what look like little swimming pools there. And they realize, hey, you know, these whales, they've got about five miles to swim out to the open ocean. We need to begin to lead them in that sort of direction. So they created the series of holes in the hopes that they would follow that and eventually swim to freedom. For whatever reason, though, it didn't work. And the whales just tended to stay there and sometimes even went back in the wrong direction. And so this whole idea wasn't working. Somebody gets in touch with the Coast Guard. The Coast Guard gets in touch with somebody in the news business. Tom Brokaw, one of the nightly news anchors, loves whale stories. So he featured it on the nightly news. And all of a sudden, this thing went viral before viral was even a thing. And back then there was a, um, a National Guard station there. They sent out a helicopter that had a giant weight attached to the bottom and they started poking some holes through the ice as well in the hopes that, you know, the, the whales would swim in that direction, but it didn't work. And again, for those of you that weren't alive at the time, back in 1988, there was another nation out there that no longer exists as it did then. And it's called the Soviet Union. And we weren't exactly friends, like ever. And so there was this animosity and all of that, but they heard about it and they sent an icebreaker ship. And it is believed that in the only time of the history of the Soviet Union versus the United States of America, that um, icebreaker flew two flags, the Soviet flag and the Stars and Stripes. That even on a global scale, animosities were set aside for the sake of freeing something that was viewed as an object of value. And all the efforts were marshaled in that direction. And you know what happened eventually once the ice was broken? They made it and it was worldwide news. The whales are free. And then the Soviets ate them. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. I just made that part up. I just made that part up. I, I can say that because I'm part Russian, so that's not true either. I'm just trying to ward off some angry emails whenever I talk about animals and things that aren't exactly great. Here's why we start with that picture, right? Something is trapped and... This whole effort was called Operation Breakthrough, and eventually it was a success. Here's why we started with that picture. In the spiritual arena, there can be faith that gets frozen over so that people underneath that are just suffocated and relieved of all their joy and passion and vitality. And the letter called Galatians, one of the letters in the New Testament, is like an operation breakthrough where people are trapped under this lifeless, cold religion that has frozen over everything that it is supposed to be. And the person who writes that letter, the Apostle Paul, cares very much about the people who are trapped underneath that layer of cold and empty religion. And it is an effort to set people free and to experience the life that they were intended to have together with God. His goal is freedom. Here's how he begins that letter. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to what? Deliver us from this present evil age. The word deliver can also be translated rescue. What is it that an infinite and a holy God has come to do in this world of ours is to deliver us, to rescue us? And can you imagine being rescued from a dangerous situation and then, for whatever reason, going back to that same place? That would be foolish. But that's what was happening in this environment. And so right off the bat, Paul wants to make sure, do you remember what God came to do? 
What did he come to do? He came to deliver us. He came to rescue us. He came to set us free. And yet something was happening in this place to people that he cared about that was taking away freedom. And this is not only something mentioned here in Galatians. These are some of Jesus' words, his first public sermon, if you will, in Luke chapter 4. He, God, has sent me, Jesus, to proclaim liberty, freedom to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed. A little bit later on in the Gospel of John, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And the Son, if He sets you free, you will be free indeed. In 2 Corinthians, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And then here in Galatians, for freedom, Christ has set us free. God's intention was never for people to be lifeless, without passion and vitality, ridden with guilt and the sense of what I could have done and should have done and ought to have done and didn't do and all of those other emotions that come along with the many ways that we can fall short. What did he come to do? To set us free. And we might wonder, well, you know, that was a long time ago and what does that have to do with here and now? I think that has everything to do with anybody who has ever answered this question in the same way that they did back then. Has your faith frozen over? Is the joy gone? Maybe you're like, I never had it to lose it. Where's the joy that comes with faith? Is there vitality? Is there passion? Is there enthusiasm? Is there life? Or does it feel like a trap? Like it's frozen over. Paul asked this question to the people then, and maybe this is a great way to phrase it for us too. What then has become of your blessedness? Blessedness can also be translated joy. Where did it go? What happened to it? Because he was there when these people put their hope and trust in Jesus. See, Paul was going around the Roman Empire starting churches and he would share who the Jesus of the Bible is, what he came to do to rescue us and to set us free from everything that enslaves us. And he began this thing called a church. And then when he was there for a while and he raised up some leaders to, to, to guide that and to lead that forward, he would go to another place and do the exact same thing. And after he left... There were some people who came behind him, and this is basically what they said. You know, Paul, you know, he told you like the ABCs, and he told you about Jesus and all that, and that's good. But you know what? We're here to tell you all the rest of the letters, and there's a whole bunch of those. Whole mess of things that he never shared with you. All those things in the Old Testament, yeah, you know what? You need to start getting busy and doing those. And so you need to eat kosher. No pork burritos anymore, no shrimp tacos, that's out. And if you're a guy, you got to be circumcised, which really cut down the membership class participation. This guy's bailed on that. And you can't mix certain fabrics together because, you know, that would be bad. And it was one thing after another. And in the end, what it did is it just froze over their faith. And so the tone of this whole letter, Paul is amped up. A little bit angry. And it's because he sees people that he cares so much about trapped under this layer of cold religion. So as a way of introduction of this book, let's talk about three ways to freeze your faith. And this is really the way that the book breaks down nice and neatly for us. And I think these are things that can still relate to people like us today. One way to freeze over your faith is grace distortion. Take a look at this. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you into the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one. What is grace? I mean, we use that word so freely, so commonly, right? We say grace before a meal. We say, well, that person's full of grace or they're very gracious and all of that is good and right. This word here, you know what it means? The 100% undeserved, unearned favor of God that he has given to you. How is somebody made right with a holy God? It is purely by the grace 
of God. Why it's as if it's a gift. How much do you pay for a gift? And you say, well, you don't pay for a gift. If you pay for it, it's no longer a gift. Exactly. And what those people coming behind Paul were doing is saying, yeah, what Jesus did is great, but now you need to roll up your sleeves and you need to get busy. So it's like Jesus plus, and here's a big blank that needs to be filled in with a whole lot of things to do. And you know what's so subtle about a grace distortion? Wouldn't it be easy if somebody came along and said, no, it's not Jesus, it's this person or it's this way, it is not Jesus, it's over here. And we'd go, well, that's pretty easy to spot, right? That's the difference between what's light and what's dark, what's good and what's bad. But this isn't 180 degrees in the opposite direction. This is, yeah, Jesus is good. And here's what you need to do. And now you need to get busy. A gospel distortion is Jesus plus anything that ultimately points to ourselves, accomplishing anything toward being made right with a holy God. Anything. And that's not the way in which our world works. And I wonder if that's why sometimes that sounds really good. Yeah, you know, God is good. But then surely on some level, don't I have to do something to make myself right with God? There was a radio announcement commercial that said, you know you need to earn some good karma. You know you're not doing enough. Today you cut a guy off on the freeway, no karma points there. The Girl Scouts came to your house to sell cookies and you pretended you weren't home, no karma points there. Anybody else guilty of that one? I'm, that's happened... <laughs> Many times in my house. Here's an easy way to rack up some karma points. Give blood. And it was an ad for the Red Cross. Now, giving blood is a good thing, right? But the whole idea of racking up karma points, maybe they didn't talk about it that way 2,000 years ago. But I think we do in this day. And whenever we talk about Jesus, we're not anti-Jesus. Jesus is good. Plus anything distorts the grace of God, which is a 100% rescue by God. A relationship with him is a gift given by God. And anything that we do to pay for that gift makes it no longer a gift, makes it no longer grace. Paul goes on here a couple of verses later, but there are some who trouble you and want to, and there it is, distort the gospel of Christ. It looks similar, but it's not the same. And that's what's so subtle and so tricky, and maybe that's why so often we can get trapped under that layer. Well, hey, you're right, it's all good, and Jesus is good, but here's what you need to do. And do you see what happens in that moment? Instead of focusing on the grace of God and the rescue of God and the heart of God that went to such great lengths to come to our rescue, all of a sudden now the attention shifts to me. How am I doing? Have I filled in the blank? Have I done my part? And nobody ever seems to be really good at telling us exactly how much we have to do in order to fulfill our part. And very subtly, Jesus there, but at the end of the day, really the focus and attention has turned to me. The word for distort can actually be translated reverse, that it reverses the grace of God by adding anything to the grace of God found only in Jesus. Some common distortions, ways that we can get this wrong. And I'll tell you in advance, this whole list here, it's going to be good things. But when we make these things the measure of our spirituality, that's when it gets off track. Feelings. Do I love God enough? Have I, you know, grown close enough to him? And how do we ever know that we've, we've done that and we can always do more? And yet feelings are part of who we are. But when we make that the measure of where we stand with God, we can miss it. And I don't know about you, for a long time, you know what I felt my biggest spiritual problem was? That I just didn't love God enough. I just didn't love Jesus enough. 
And if I would, I'd think about it more often than I do because there are times when I don't and times when I just pass by opportunities in all kinds of different ways to have my heart go in God's direction. But I've come to this conclusion. My biggest problem is not that I don't love Jesus enough. It's that I don't know how much Jesus truly loves me. Because the truth is, in a relationship with him, you are loved infinitely by an infinite God. And this may not sound right because it's not like the world in which we live, but God does not love you more on your best days than he does on your worst days. And he doesn't love you less on your worst days than he does on your best days. And yet that sort of sense can seep in, right? That, hey, if I had a really good week with God, God's going to bless me. He's going to bless me more. And if I didn't do so good, well, maybe God's going to even the score a little bit. And that's why I got that flat tire, why I got pulled over and got that ticket, because God was getting even with me. And on a much more serious level, I've had people actually ask me this when they got a cancer diagnosis, is God punishing me? And can I just flat out say, God does not work that way. And the love of God is not up for grabs based on your behavior or mine. He loves you. But it's so easy for us to attach our spiritual performance to our relationship with God and think that somehow at the end of the day, it's up to me. Another way is good deeds, right? So it's Jesus plus, now let me become a good person. And what does that mean? And who defines that? And how much is good enough? And we seem to be real fuzzy on some of those details. So what sounds good at the surface really doesn't work out so well in reality. And then maybe another distortion is sacrifice. And I hear this one, especially among younger generations. Have you gone radically enough in God's direction? Have you left behind, you know, so much? And again, what's the measure of that? And who determines how much of that is enough? And there never seems to be a specific answer to that. And then maybe also obedience. Are you following enough of the rules? Are you doing enough things? Now, again, that whole list, those are good things. And I hope those things describe my spiritual life and yours as well. But when they become the measure of our spirituality, we distort the grace that is found only in Jesus. I don't know how many of you are familiar with something called a tract. That used to be a little pamphlet that people would just coldly hand out to people that had some information there about God and a relationship with Him. And I think, you know, that spiritual influence in our day comes primarily through relationship, and so I'm glad that's kind of fallen by the wayside. But there was one um, that was handed out a number of years ago, and the title of it was, Jesus Says Don't. Doesn't that just sound like an invitation to great joy, right? Jesus says don't. And then there were 40 things that Jesus says don't to. One was don't have long hair if you are a guy. Paging Pastor Jimmy. Some people want to talk to you outside. (laughs) Don't wear gold or pearls. Don't teach anything that is not in the King James Version about Um, about God. Don't tell jokes or use puppetry to explain the Word of God. Yep, God is against puppets. (laughs) And one more, don't become a Las Vegas Raider fan. That's one I actually agree with um, that was in there, but that's for another day. Right, all of a sudden it becomes about all these standards, right, of are you doing enough? Have you filled in the blank? And they're all good things, but they are not the measure of spirituality. Those are ways to respond to the love of God and the grace of God, but not to earn anything. See, grace is opposed to earning. It's a gift. It's not opposed to effort, but the effort is our response to the goodness of God. So three ways to freeze your face. Number one, faith, face, faith. One is grace distortion. The second is behavior modification. Another way to talk about this, and we've already begun to kind of entertain this idea, is legalism. What is legalism? The more rules I keep, the more mature I am. So how are you doing? 
And legalism is all about me measuring myself in comparison to you. How are you doing? Are you ahead of me? Am I ahead of you? And how does all of that play out? And if I'm doing more things, I'm more mature than you are. Story that I heard about that, you know, two guys are in a college dorm room at a Christian school. And so at the end of the day, the one guy, you know, was reading his Bible. Then he'd get on his knees and he would pray and kind of be leaning over his bed. And the other guy's like, well, I do that too, but, you know, it's kind of quick. And this guy, man, it's like a half an hour he spends there, you know, just kind of leaned over and praying. So he's like, I got to do the same thing that he's doing. So he's there and he's getting tired and would look back. The guy's still leaning down there. And finally, one day he goes, How did you get to the place where you are so? spiritual that you can pray for, you know, a half an hour at the end of the night. He goes, oh yeah, I should have probably told you. Whenever I get on my knees at the end of the day, I'm really tired. I fall asleep. (laughs) But it became this competition. And when we make it all about, how am I doing compared to you? The focus has shifted, hasn't it? From the grace of God to me and you and us and one another. And that is not exactly where we find life. Legalism also is the better I behave, the more God will love me and the more I can expect God's blessing in my lives. And that's just not the way that it works. And I love the way Paul calls out these people. Now, remember, he's pretty amped up. He's concerned where all of this is taking them. Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, that's how you got there. God did it. Are you now being perfected by the flesh? In other words, do you think you can finish what God started and can only do? How's that working out for you? It's freezing over your faith and stealing your joy. Galatians 5.1, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. For a long time, I thought the yoke of slavery was the habits or the sins, you know, that mark my life, that bring me down. But really what he's talking about is cold, empty, performance-based religion that chokes the spiritual life out of you. So what God is seeking to do is not just to perform some act of behavior modification where we get ourselves together and try really hard, but instead he wants us to focus on him and where he has taken us. So grace distortion, behavior modification, another way to freeze your faith is self-satisfaction. Maybe another way to talk about this is kind of like hedonism. Hey, if it feels good, I'm just going to do it. Because after all, and I get this challenge sometimes, you guys talk about grace way too easily. Doesn't that just mean you can do anything you want and it doesn't matter? And I get grace is risky. Grace is abused sometimes. Grace is misapplied. Grace sometimes is this umbrella under which maybe I just do whatever I want to do because it feels good and feels right and nobody's going to tell me any different. And so Paul says, you know, down that road, you're not going to find life either. For you were called to freedom, right? We've been set free, brothers, only. Do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, serve one another. That we're set free to go in a certain direction. We're set free so that we can follow God, which we cannot do all on our own and all by ourselves. We're set free to follow him. Right? And freedom, you know, we live in a free country, thank goodness, and we're free to do all kinds of things, right? We're free to eat whatever we want. So let me ask you this, why don't you eat garbage? We go, well, it's not good for you. Exactly. Freedom is not licensed to do anything and everything. It's free to go in a certain direction. I don't know if you've ever had a spare refrigerator. We have one of those in our garage. And that's where some things get put, you know, when there are some leftovers. And one week we had chicken enchiladas and we didn't finish them off. And so it got put in the spare fridge. And then you know how stuff gets piled in there. And all of a sudden before you know it, you know, you don't even see it anymore. Well, there were chicken enchiladas that had been in that spare fridge for seven weeks. (laughs) And then one day our son-in-law's at our house and we weren't there and he was hungry. And so he went searching and he looked through the normal fridge and then went out to the spare fridge and then lo and behold, behind some other things, chicken enchiladas. And he ate them all. It's the last enchilada he's ever had in his life. No bueno. 
And I think what Paul's talking about is, yeah, there's freedom, but you know what? That doesn't mean that everything's good for you. And so freedom allows us to move in a certain direction, a direction in which God has called us. And where God calls us and where we follow after him, we find life. And notice how the opportunity is there for us to focus on who God is and rather than ourselves. I will say, walk by the Spirit. Walk is the idea, not just, you know, us putting one foot in front of the other. It's how we live day to day. It's what we do. It's what we just habitually, increasingly learn to do. And where's the focus? By the Spirit. Not on me. Not on my behavior. Not on my performance. The focus is on God. And I learned this lesson in a not-too-spiritual environment. I was getting my motorcycle license a couple years ago right out here in the parking lot of the church. And, you know, when you're on a motorcycle and you're learning, you're so focused, where are my hands and where are my feet and where's the cone that I need to miss and all of that. And here's what the instructor said over and over again. Don't look where you are. Look where you're going. And the bike will go where you're looking. And so we were learning even how to do sort of a hairpin turn. Well, you don't look like this and focus on the cone and everything. You look where you're going, and sure enough, you go in that direction. In the spiritual arena, when our focus is on God rather than ourselves, we move in God's direction. So Paul's saying, hey, these people have come along and they've told you to focus on all these other things, Jesus plus, and now you're focused on the blank which ultimately is all about you. Walk by the Spirit. What does that mean? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. That's where God wants to take you. But that's only done as we focus on Him and not us. So, in Jesus, we're set free. He came to rescue us. But does that mean that anything goes and whatever we want to do, let's just do that? In Jesus, we are set free to follow Jesus. And that's what we are made for. And that's where life is found. And that's where joy and vitality and passion will be discovered when the focus and attention is not on us but on the God who has come to our rescue. And he did all of that for you. Would you bow your heads together with me? So God, on this day, we are so thankful for who you are. So grateful for your goodness and your grace to us. And God, there's something in the human heart where we in some way, shape, or form, we want to make it about ourselves. God, forgive us for those moments. And your love and all that you have accomplished, it includes us, but it is not about us. It is about you. And so may we draw closer to the God who has loved us unconditionally. And may we seek to respond in ways that just follow after you and that seek to bring honor to your name. And so we thank you for great love that is every bit undeserved and yet so freely given by the heart of God, which is full of grace. And we ask and we pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen. We hope you enjoyed today's message. If you found this sermon meaningful, Please subscribe, rate, and leave a review. Your support helps us reach more people and spread the word. Stay connected with us throughout the week by following us on social media at Washington Heights Church on Facebook and Instagram, and by visiting our website at whc.faith. For more information and additional resources, check out the podcast description below. Thank you for joining us. See you next week.